Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to Mile Higher Podcast, episode 179. Today, we are following up on a previous episode on Gabby Petito, and a lot has happened since we last so recorded. Much stuff. Um, we, we recorded our last episode on September 27th, and we are recording, what is it today? The Sept- 16th of October. Wow, time is flying by. So we've had over a month of the search of Brian for Brian Laundry at this point, and honestly, not too many updates that are anything hopeful Mm-mm. regarding him, but plenty to talk about regarding the search for him. Well, it's now called a manhunt at this point. But also just a lot of of things with the timeline of events mm-hmm. and sort of everything that's unfolded. We have new body cam footage that was released that shows a completely different side to the whole incident in Moab that we're going to go through. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a lot of you know other people now involved in addition to Dog the Bounty Hunter. John Walsh is uh, on the hunt as well. I mean, there's a lot happening with this case and the manhunt for Brian Laundry. So, and most recently there was a a big update regarding Gabby's autopsy from the coroner and her manner of death. We will get into all of that today, um, but it's been, it's been pretty heavy to watch all of this unfold and hear from her family more. And speaking of which um, her family actually just reached out to us through Gary Ryder, who's been the one coordinating the foundation. He's on the board for the Gabby Petito foundation and he reached out saying he watched our episode last time and thanked us for the coverage and also thanked us for making a donation to the Gabby Petito Foundation for $50,000 from our media company. We feel very confident about making this donation. This family has shown such strength and just pure hearts of gold through all of this and have spoken out about how not all people get this coverage from the media, not all people get this attention from the police, how many families are out there with missing children who just do not get any support and how they want to help change that. And that's the mission of this foundation is to help people in Gabby's situation, similar situations to Gabby, people who are dealing with domestic violence. And I think they're going to do really amazing things. So we feel very confident and happy about making this donation to them. And I also wanted to thank all of you for supporting our content coverage on this case without you guys, you know, watching us and supporting what we're doing. We wouldn't have been able to make that donation. So thank you. To yeah, all of you. absolutely. I think it's just, we felt like extremely compelled to support this family and their, their efforts with this foundation, because clearly there's a huge need for, for this type of, just not, you know, this type of support out there for people going through similar situations uh, and in relationships similar to what Gabby was in. And so it's really cool to see in just the worst of days to be so focused on turning this into a positive and making sure that Gabby's legacy lives on through this foundation to hopefully save lives in the future and provide aids and services to organizations that across the country that help people in crisis. And so, yeah, I mean, I just want to say that, you know, thank you all to for supporting us and watching the show and, um, you know, we couldn't have done it without you guys. So, and one thing I wanted to point out from his email to us is he said, it is our hope that we can turn this tragedy into a positive and that this foundation will be the vehicle in which we can make sure that others have the same support we were able to find in our worst moments, which will help keep Gabby's spirit alive that that was really powerful. So I'm excited to see what they're going to do. And I'm just in awe by them. They are just incredible. Yeah. And well, I mean, we're, we're here to provide support in any way that we can. So, mm-hmm. and it's like, they didn't have to do that. They didn't have, they could have made all the press conferences just about Gabby and they have every right to do that as parents, but they took it a step up to talk to other people and pointed straight at the media and said, you guys have to step it up. The police have to step it up with press conferences and that's another thing I wanted to bring up. We've we see your requests for the Jelani Day case. It's been something we have been following since Jelani was considered missing. And we've been trying to pull together some type of content, whether that's on this podcast or on my channel on Jelani Day's case. But the lack of information that has come out has been really challenging. And recently, incorrect information was released and you know, a few days later, it was clarified by his mother and his family 
that a lot of it wasn't true. There's a lot of rumors going around. I mean, at this point, we just have to wait for the facts in the case. We can't rush it because we don't ever want to hurt the family further or make things more difficult or say something that's not true because a lot of what was being reported was from Chicago Times. And oftentimes that's a rep considered a reputable source. But with cases like this, where there's such a lack of information coming from law enforcement and pretty much no press conferences, I think there's been one, maybe two, it's hard to put the pieces together in a way that's actually correct. And it can affect a future trial, especially now that we know Jelani was, I mean, they can't, we can't officially say he was murdered. His family believes he was murdered. It's very obvious that this was not someone jumping into the river. And I'm sure a lot of you are confused about what I'm even talking about, but I highly encourage you to look into this case and be aware of what's going on and follow it. And I promise when the time is right and we have enough of the facts, we will be covering the Jelani Day case because it is, it's horrific. Yeah, there's obviously a lot to unpack there and a lot, a lot. that we still don't know. I mean, yeah. the last thing that we want to do is be irresponsible with the platform that we have and jump on something before there's really concrete mm -hmm. information available that we can really, you know, look at and then also match up with other sources. When you're getting information from one source and they're the first to break news about a case or something and if we were to just jump on that and roll with it, it could potentially go completely against what the family believes and what they want. Mm -hmm. And that's the last thing we want to do. We're not here to try to create rifts between the family mm -hmm. and you know what we're saying because we're just going off of what we're finding on the internet. So rather than doing that, we try to play we play it safe and we wait for more information to come out so we can sort of create this complete as much of a complete picture as we can around the case mm -hmm. and and have enough resources to go to because I think people have to remember we're not investigators we're not out right. there like actively trying to gain information mm -hmm. on a case that's not our jobs here we're we're purely messengers I mean we're here to spread the word and raise awareness about cases but organize in a way that makes sense right and and also make place. sure we have the facts right before we do that because yeah. we can't just go if we just jumped on everything as soon as it broke it would cause probably more harm than good and that's why we run. have been so cautious with gabby's case and we've waited and pushed content or um, waited an additional week to get more information or clarification on something and we don't go into theories and what psychics are saying and all of this because none of that is useful we really are trying to stick to the facts and stick to what the family is saying above all else so yeah, yeah. i mean it's just important that people know that because mm -hmm. a lot of people you know assume assume things or assume that we don't care about something no. when they really have no idea really i mean what's going on behind the scenes here we have been here. following this case jelani's case alongside gabby's or about the same time, you know, we started hearing about it close to the same time. And I mean, we've both, all of us have been just like freaked out by the details of that one. And I mean, to the point where I've literally had nightmares over it. So we certainly care and we want to talk about it. It's very important. This case is, it needs way more coverage than it's getting. But with that being said, do you want to go ahead and jump in? Yes. Yeah, so let's go ahead and, and kind of figure out where we left off with our last episode. Mm -hmm. We're going to kind of go back over the timeline a little bit because there has been some things that have changed with it. Yeah. And also, if you're just tuning into this episode, maybe you just found our show and you're jumping into this Gabby Petito episode. We kind of wanted to give a little bit of context of what's kind of happened up to this point very briefly, but more so focus on the things that have changed, the new information that's come out and where things kind of stand currently. So although we do recommend watching the previous yes, episode absolutely. or you probably will co be confused if this is your first time learning about this case. Exactly. Because again, we did we filmed the previous one on September 27th and we're now on October 16th. So that's a lot of time that's passed. But sort of where we left off, I guess, with the last episode was we were basically I think we stopped at dog the bounty hunter getting involved yep uh law enforcement is in the Carlton Reserve doing lots and lots of searches there we talked mostly towards the end about the idea of him of Brian being in the Appalachian Mountains because that was dog's initial theory that kind of changed all the next day and his focus became the Fort DeSoto campground due to tips we that were explain. coming in uh coming into his tip line as as where i believe he got that tip yes. about the fort yep. desoto campground mm -hmm. and about multiple Brian tips and his family being there so dog headed out to 
uh, the Fort DeSoto campground area to search that for for Brian Laundry. And records were pulled, and this was confirmed that they right. were there. We will go over all of it exactly. And also, there was a you know arrest warrant put out from the FBI, mm-hmm. um, basically saying, "Hey, Brian is now wanted for fraud for using a debit card." Uh, I think we did. We did cover speak that. Speak on that. Last we did. Time, yes. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. But that's just kind of where. Things were sort of left off mm-hmm. with as far as Brian Laundry goes. There's still no idea where he is. He's only a person of interest in the mm-hmm. homicide of, of Gabby Petito. All right. So the timeline for this case really begins on July 2nd, 2021, when Gabby Petito and Brian Laundry they leave Blue Point, New York, in order to start their cross-country road trip. And then basically over the coming days from about July 4th all the way through July 30th, they are just traveling across the country. They're visiting a bunch of national parks in Colorado, in Utah, a bunch of beautiful places. They're taking Instagram photos that are being posted throughout this time. And this is really kind of the way that we're able to track their movement during this road trip is from the posts that they're putting up on social media. But then things kind of take a major turn on August 12th when Moab City Police pull Gabby and Brian over in their van near Arches National Park. The officer had actually followed them after responding to an anonymous 911 call about an incident earlier near the Moonflower Co-op. And this was an incident that occurred where Brian and Gabby were seen fighting publicly and someone called 911 to report that a man was slapping a woman. And there's a clip of the 911 call. We'll play that now. Hi, uh, I'm calling. I'm right on the corner of Main Street by Moonflower and... We're driving by, and I'd like to report a domestic dispute in Florida with a white van, Florida license plate, white land, gentleman, Where's about five, six beard. They just drove off. They're going down Main Street. They made a, uh, a ride onto Main Street from Moonflower. Uh, we drove by, and the gentleman was slapping the girl. He was slapping her? Yes, and then we stopped. They ran up and down the sidewalk. He proceeded to hit her, hopped in the car, and they drove off. White van, I give you the I give you the license plate if you give me one sec. I took okay. a picture of it. It was a smaller van with the license plate of it was white, Florida license plate QFT G O three. So the incident at the Moonflower Co op was observed by several witnesses who observed them arguing. There at one point Brian was in the van and Gabby was trying to climb through the driver's side window, was kind of hitting him on the arm, because obviously she was like, Why are you locking me out? And there were some more words that was exchanged there. And, and just a reminder, it's Gabby's van. Right. Gabby owns the vehicle, yet Brian's locking her out. And so after this, they left the co-op and Officer Daniel Robin started pursuing the van, kind of just following it. And at one point, the van was driving 45 miles per hour in a 15 mile per hour zone. And it was at that point that he observed uh, Gabby's van crossing the yellow line on the road and then swerving basically into the curb before coming to a stop and at that point obviously they're speeding and he's you know they're driving erratically and so the officer pulls brian over so in the last episode we went over the initial body cam footage that was released by the moab police department and there were several red flags concerns that we had brought up that many other have many others have brought up and on october 1st the moab city police department released another bit of body cam footage and it is incredibly disturbing i definitely want to release a trigger warning before we get into this but this new body cam footage is from officer eric pratt who responded to the reports of domestic violence between gabby and brian on august 12th so in the footage we can see officer pratt first approaching the van and speaking with brian and he said we got a call about a male hitting a female how's it going how are you doing? Good. Hey, we got a call about a male hitting a female and the two of them getting in this vehicle and taking off. So I, it, it was, I, 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 I just, I don't want to try and defend myself by saying anything here, but I pushed her away. She, she gets really worked up and when she does, she swings and she had her cell phone in her hand. So I just tried to push her away. After this, he walks away to talk to Gabby and get her side of the story. And Gabby explains that she has been stressed all that morning and was trying to get work done on her blog. She also explained that she has OCD and can sometimes have a, quote, mean attitude, even though she's not trying to be mean. She also explained that she was apologizing to Brian and he got frustrated with her mean tone. So he locked her out of her van and told her to take a breather. 
But she said that she didn't want to take a breather. She was already calm. She just wanted to get on the road and refill their water because she was really thirsty and she's being locked out of a van in the hot sun in Utah. Gabby wanted to sit in the van and keep working. And even though Brian was taking his own walk, he wouldn't let her in. I was just really stressed this morning trying to get a lot of work done. And I was apologizing to him. I had thrown a bunch of stuff in the back. All our bags were back then. I was just apologizing. I was like, I'm sorry that I get so stressed out because I have OCD and I was just like organizing stuff. And sometimes I just have a mean attitude, but I'm not trying to be mean about straightening things up and stuff. So I was just apologizing, but I guess I said it in like a mean tone and he got really frustrated with me and he walked me out of the car and told me to go take a breather, but I didn't want to take a breather because I wanted to get going. We're out, we're out of water. So it kind of made you more upset. <laughs> yeah, it didn't help calm you. It made you more upset. Yeah. And, so then what happened? And, um, so I, I, our goal was to come here and come refill our water. So what happened after he locked you out? I told you to take a uh, breather. Well, he walked away to go take his own breather, and but I wanted to sit in the car because there was all my stuff was in the car. I had none of my bag. And I had to, I was working on something at the moment in the car, and he told me to just relax for a second, and I, I didn't want to relax, so I got got really mad. And, I mean, I don't need to be mad. Yeah, that happens. Then what happened? After you got and, then, mad. and then I told him to drive. At this point, Officer Pratt points out a mark on Gabby's cheek. This was not something we knew about before this footage was released, and he asked her if she got hit in the face. Gabby hesitated, and then he pointed out the bruise on her arm as well. She said she didn't know. She wasn't sure. It all happened really fast. She then kind of mumbled something about her backpack, and Officer Pratt concluded by saying, so the backpack got you. Yeah, is there something on your cheek here? Looks like did, did you get did you get hit in the face? Um, kind of looks like something like hitting you in the face. I don't and then over on your arm, um, your shoulder, right here. There's, that's new, huh? It's kind of a new mark. Oh yeah, I don't know. Can I see the other side of your face? So, what happened here and here? Um, I I'm not sure. It was a. So the backpack gotcha. I mean, can't the he officer like that. realize that she is clearly scared to mm-hmm. talk about what's re- what really happened, and right. therefore is covering for Brian? I mean, mm-hmm. I mean, as an officer, you should have responded to many domestic violence calls by this point that you would know that this is a common practice that occurs where especially with the witness reports that they were already aware about which that was a big right, question did exactly. they know that information at this time and they did and it seems like they just are completely starting from scratch like instead mm-hmm. of taking into consideration what's already been reported mm-hmm. that happened prior to this stop they're seemingly starting from ground zero acting like they have no information about mm-hmm. these two or their history just because the weird remarks that he's made, I mean, the backpack got you like what? Yeah, it's it's very strange. And it's clear there's a major lack of training here for victims of trauma and domestic violence. And they just aren't equipped to see those signs. And of course, people are people feel bad for the mm-hmm. officers because they're like now they probably feel really guilty. But at this point, someone lost their life. And it's much more about it's not about their feelings or hindsight no. is twenty twenty. This is about making change to save future lives. And that's why we have to analyze this and find the problems that were made, the mistakes that were made so that this can be prevented in the future. Because I truly believe that all police departments should have some type of team that can be dispatched in domestic violence situations who are trained, who know the signs, who can... Yeah, absolutely. You know, and if they had just even if they... Obviously, they don't have that. So it would have been so much better if they could have just brought her in for questioning or him and gotten more information. Right. They didn't Um, do enough investigation into the incident. And unfortunately, that ended up costing Gabby her life. When in if they had done more investigation and it's had actually brought one of them in and actually took the time to Mm -hmm. confirm everything that had happened earlier, then quite honestly, I think there's enough enough evidence or enough. You know, of a probable cause to arrest somebody based on 
the incident that happened mm-hmm. earlier. You know, and there should have been something that happened, not just right. let's separate you two for the night. There's physical assault happening. I mean, there's mm-hmm. literally a physical abuse happening in this particular incident. There's proof of it. And the fact that they're just seemingly trying to dismiss it and 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 the way that they're asking questions is in order to explain the injuries you know mm-hmm. the backpack might have scratched you you know mm-hmm. that this was all you know kind of a yeah happens chance thing and this becomes even more obvious as this footage continues so we'll we'll dive back into that but yeah it's very obvious that serious mistakes were yeah. made here and many people have been making the argument that the officers were just trying to keep both of them out of jail because that's what they wanted well think of how different things could have been if one of them was brought into jail. Exactly. So as he continues to ask her about her injuries, she hesitated again and stumbled over her words. He continued to interrupt her during all of this and ask follow-up questions very quickly before she would even answer the first question he asked. And as a lot of you out there know, victims of trauma need that additional time to process questions, answer them, especially if they're in the moment right then. Uh, and the answer could put them in danger. So there's a whole level of fear yeah. and Brian's right there. Right. Mm-hmm. They're not that far apart from each other. I mean, mm-hmm. she's probably worried that he's going to overhear something she says because obviously they, they separate them, but they don't mm-hmm. separate them enough. Most likely to or where that something she says could, end could up, get back to him or, or she's could, worried the officer will go bring it up with right. him or something. So, or action will be taken against him. And sh- you know, what are the repercussions of, basically Mm -hmm. selling out Brian, you know, to the officers. And that's all these things that she's thinking. Could he be angry with me? Could he not want to, would it ruin our future? I mean, they're planning this life together. I mean, there's so many things to going through your mind in a situation like that, that you, you have to have time to process it and really think, think it through. He could have even threatened her while they were getting pulled over. Like if you fucking spill the beans in any way, like there'll be hell to pay. You know, that's yeah. totally speculation. Or I'll, I'll go, go to jail wrong. and right. you'll be alone. Exactly. Yeah. And yep. definitely this what is speculation. What are you going to do out here without me? Just trying to explain what could have been missed here. Right. So Officer Pratt then said that two people told them that they saw Brian hit her and punch her. So they fully were aware that that had happened. And Gabby said, to be honest, I hit him first because Brian had told her to shut up. She consistently took the blame for everything throughout the entire body cam footage. She said she slapped him just a couple of times and then he grabbed her arms to stop her. There's two people saying that they saw him punch you. We're just independent witnesses by Moonflower. Well, to be honest, I definitely hit him first. Where'd you hit him? I slapped him in the face. You slapped him first? And then what, just on his face? And he kept telling me to shut up. How many times did you slap Bravo, him? Romeo, India, Alpha. Just a couple. And then what, and his reaction was to do what? Okay, be I'm going to he just grabbed you she also showed officer pratt how brian had grabbed her in the face but then said that he didn't hit her or punch her in the face officer pratt asked her about the slapping and she confirmed that he didn't slap her however she clearly said brian grabbed her face with his nail and cut her cheek she said i definitely have a cut right here and that she could feel it and it was burning And for some reason, Officer Pratt took Gabby's slaps as aggressive, but Brian grabbing her face and cutting her with his nail as defensive. Did he hit you, though? I mean, I mean, it's okay if you're saying you hit him and then I I understand if he hit you. But we want to know the truth if he actually hit you. Because, you know, I guess. Yeah, but I hit him first. Where did he hit you? Don't don't worry. Just be honest. He grabbed my face like, I guess. Uh huh. Um, he didn't like hit me in the face. Like you know, like punch me in the face or anything. Did he slap but, your face or what? Well, like he like grabbed me like with his nail, and I guess that's why it looks. I definitely have a cut right here. It's like a peel it. Yeah. Like, it's cut it burns. <laughs> but. Uh, well, okay. Then they go on to discuss Brian's driving, which Gabby also ends up taking the blame for. So has he been drinking? No, we don't drink. Okay. What was up with his driving? I, this officer said he hit a curb. I, I, I hit him. While yeah. you're driving? Well, he was driving. While he was driving, you were hitting him? Well, not a lot, but yeah. But that was distracting him while he's driving? Are you not, tra- only for like a second, but only because I saw him, I saw the like come on and I like kind of like, 
Did you already okay. tell him all this? I didn't get that far into okay, it. She so was she was hyperventilating. She's a little saying bit. that they don't, they don't drink, but at the point when you lit them up, you don't drink or anything. I, she started I was hitting just, it. Yeah, I was yelling at him, and then when and you turned your lights on, I like kind of punched the arm. Like there's a, there's a she's, she's saying was why he hit the curb. Gabby ended up telling the officers about her anxiety and Brian's anxiety, and she said she didn't take any medications, which they later confirmed with Brian, though they never asked Gabby if Brian takes any medication. Officer Pratt tried to relate to her by saying that his current partner helps him calm down his anxiety while his ex-wife would make it worse. Do you, do you have um, medication for anxiety you take? Or anything? No. You t- do you take any medication for any... I just do yoga and- Try to meditate and stuff, but you tend to have a lot of anxiety and stress. <laughs> I have a lot of anxiety. And what's his name? Is it Brian? Is he usually pretty patient with you? <laughs> yeah, but I get it. Just makes me upset. I know that he definitely gets frustrated with me a lot because I have a lot of anxiety, and he definitely has anxiety too. Well, that could be a bad combo if you both have anxiety. <laughs> you know, I have anxiety too, and you know, my girlfriend. Uh, my girlfriend's really, really calm. And she has a way of taking my anxiety and bringing it down. But my ex-wife, that's why she's my ex-wife, I'm just sharing, I know it's a little personal, but to help you understand, we would feed off each other's anxiety and it would spiral. You know what I mean? And it doesn't matter how much I loved her. It may be a bad for your soul. Just saying. I'm not telling you what to do with your life, but if you know you have anxiety, look at the, look at the situations you can get in. Officer Pratt then walks back over to Brian. He asks him to stand in the shade out of the sun and they talked about Brian's injuries. And Officer Pratt told Brian that Gabby has marks on her too. Okay. You want to come stand in the shade? <laughs> you're you're hot. Really me. <laughs> yeah, I know how. The, I know the. I know the. Str- I, I, I know the struggle. <laughs> so you guys, you don't drink or anything? No. Okay. So you were talking to these officers. I don't mean to butt in. I just felt kind of bad for you. Maybe if you stand here, you'll have more shade. <laughs> I don't want to. Right. Do Weirdo ducking down a bit. No, I know I, I, how it I, I, is. I have a pivot sombrero. <laughs> well, from when I first got here, we were more worried about what kind of a guy you are from what we heard. But in talking to your girlfriend, it sounds to me like maybe this is not so clear cut. So, did you already give a statement to this officer? Uh, I got this I, gentleman here. Yeah. And this gentleman noticed that you had some marks on your on your neck. Yeah. yeah. And she's got I some marks on her too. So we're just trying to figure out what all happened. And I- Officer Pratt then leaves the conversation to get water for Gabby, and he told the female officer that it was okay for her to now talk to Gabby, adding that she seems like a really sweet girl. And then Officer Pratt said that from what Gabby is saying, she's the full-on aggressor here. The female officer confirmed that's what Brian said, too. From what she's claiming, she's the full-on aggressor here. I'd love to go talk to the independent witnesses, and maybe that's what I'll go do. This is just so wild to me, because... They're not even considering the fact that Brian is just acting a certain type of way to keep himself out of trouble. I mean, Mm -hmm. it just seems so naive of these officers to just be going with what Gabby's scared. Mm -hmm. She's crying. She's clearly in in major distress, which they noted because Brian's so cool, calm and collected and just being so chill and Mm -hmm. friendly with them that gabby's the out of control aggressor here and that's just so crazy to me that they're just failing to to realize that that's exactly what brian's trying to convince them of like they're literally yeah. falling for for brian's act here and again it's a lack of training when it comes to domestic violence it's it's a very complicated it's just, i don't even know if it's lack of training because it doesn't seem that hard to figure this out like it seems to me like this is just them trying to they're they're misjudging the situation to me when i watch the body cam footage i think these guys just think that this is just this young couple out here camping and that they had a hard day and maybe they are scrapping a little bit with each other but you know there's nothing else to this picture Mm -hmm. other than they just didn't dig deeper no exactly and they just judged it at a very surface level so they're like oh okay maybe if we can just kind of wrap this thing Mm -hmm. up and get them them both on their ways that you know we don't need to make a big deal about this because obviously mm-hmm. a lot of times with with police, I mean, the last thing they want to do is have to take this big, long report, do an investigation, all the paperwork involved with it. And I mean, they still had to write a report on this incident. But plus, I mean, their argument has been that Gabby and Brian were begging not to go to jail. They didn't want either. They didn't. Neither one wanted to press charges. They just wanted to. But but to me, I'm like, that's that's just wrong because there is no, I know. Plenty I agree with to you. press charges here. I'm just saying that's what they're. Yeah, no, I know. And that's as. a major 
Yeah, it's incredibly fail. frustrating. It really is to watch all of this. Um, we're going to take a quick break and then we will dive back into the rest of the body cam footage. Imagine if every crime could be halted before it happened. Well, while you can't stop every criminal in their tracks, what if you could deter them? That's what Simply Safe's new wireless outdoor security camera aims to do. It's wireless so it can install anywhere, extending Simply Safe's perimeter of defense from your windows and doors to the far corners of your property. I got to say, I absolutely love Simply Safe's home security system. I've had security systems from all the big names and they all sucked and paled in comparison to Simply Safe. The reason I love Simply Safe so much is because it really is super easy to set up. You don't have to pay any extra money for somebody to come install it for you, although you can if you want, but you can literally install this system super easily within like an hour or less all by yourself. What I love most about Simply Safe is the fact that you can cater your system to whatever size of house or apartment you may live in. So you can make sure everywhere you want to be secured can be secured. And now with this outdoor security camera, for me specifically, I live on a big lot. So obviously my land stretches a lot farther than the cameras on my house can even see. So having this wireless outdoor security camera allows me to put it out by my mailbox because we've had mail thieves. So I can try to deter people from stealing my mail, hopefully, or catch them in the act and report it to the police. It really is absolutely amazing what this wireless outdoor security camera can do. Also, Simply Safe's cameras actually work. The quality of the resolution is amazing. It's HD 1080p, plus you can eight times zoom with them, which makes it really, really easy to zoom in on license plates and faces if you need to. The wireless outdoor security camera from Simply Safe has an easy to remove rechargeable battery, so it doesn't need an outlet, which is really, really nice. So to learn more about the exciting new Simply Safe wireless outdoor security camera, or to configure a system for your home, visit simplysafe.com slash mile higher. Simply Safe is offering 20% off your entire new system, plus you'll get your first month of monitoring service free when you enroll in interactive monitoring. Again, that's simplysafe.com slash mile higher. So I don't know about you guys, but lately I have been experiencing a lot of stress and anxiety and a huge part of me taking care of that is by giving myself time to meditate and taking that time that's just for me. With all the stress that we've all been through over the past couple of years, it's really more important than ever to practice living a healthier and happier life. So what if only a few minutes a day was all it took to change your relationship with stress and anxiety and possibly transform your life for the better? Well, that's the power of meditation with Headspace. Our thoughts can be confusing enough. Meditation doesn't have to be. Headspace is your convenient dose of meditation, mindfulness, and sleep exercises to help relieve stress and anxiety to help you get a good night's sleep all in one app and making it easy to catch your breath and make time for your mental health. And it's one of the most science-backed meditation apps in the world, proving meditation works. A study proves in just two weeks on Headspace, it can reduce your stress by 14%. Personally, I love their SOS mini meditations for a quick breather. If you feel like things are kind of spiraling, it helps instantly relieve my stress and brings me a moment of peace amongst my daily chaos. So find some Headspace at headspace.com slash mile higher and get one month free of the entire meditation library. This is the best Headspace offer available. So go to headspace.com slash mile higher today. Again, that's headspace.com slash mile higher. Using the internet without ExpressVPN is like checking in your baggage at the airport without a lock. You think your stuff is kept private, but you never know who's going to go through your belongings. Why does everyone need a VPN? Well, everybody needs a VPN because unfortunately, internet service providers can see every single website you visit, they track all of that, and they legally sell this information without your consent to ad companies and tech giants. And then they use this data in order to target you with ads and so on and so forth. Using a VPN essentially creates a virtual tunnel for all of your internet traffic to go through that's completely secured that cannot be accessed by internet service providers as well as hackers. So you can make sure you're browsing online anonymously and all of your data in the sites you visit are secure, which is absolutely amazing, especially if you travel or go to coffee shops, use public Wi-Fi, library, that sort of thing. You absolutely want to make sure you're using a VPN because a hacker could be snooping the different devices and traffic on that network and easily obtain your usernames and passwords for your banking information and anything else that you have on your computer for that matter. So by using ExpressVPN, you completely lock that down and make sure that you are protected from start to finish during your next session on the internet. 
I love ExpressVPN because it's super easy to use. There's an app, you just fire it up and then you click one button and boom, you're connected. Plus it works on all your devices, phones, laptops, even routers, which is really, really, really cool. I never thought it would be possible for a VPN service to be so easy for the average consumer, but they have done it. So secure your online activity by visiting expressvpn.com slash milehire today. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S vpn.com slash milehire and you'll get an extra three months free. Again, that's expressvpn.com slash milehire. At this point, Officer Pratt left to talk to the independent witnesses and he was only able to get one on the phone and it wasn't the person that had actually called 911. According to this witness, the male was trying to grab the female's phone and he wasn't letting her into the van uh, while he was also trying to get into the driver's seat. He also described Gabby as hitting Brian like children fighting and added that something just seemed very off about the interaction. Officer Pratt also asked the witness if they saw the male hitting the female. The witness hesitated and then said he saw a push or a shove, but not a punch to the face. Officer Pratt continued this line of questioning, asking if it was a defensive move by the male. The witness couldn't confirm it was defensive or aggressive, but he said that the whole thing was kind of light and they were almost laughing. And again, commented that the whole interaction just seemed very strange. He had sort of blocked the one side of the van and sort of wasn't letting her in. And, and then the male was stepping into the driver's seat. And she was trying to get into the van. I think she said something about why are you being so mean, something like that. And um, I, I remember she sort of hit him um, a few times. And it wasn't like slugs in the face, but just kind of like, like kind of like two kids kind of fighting. They, they reminded me of very secure, I don't know, <laughs> children sort of fighting. Um, but there seemed like something was off, and like a weird vibe. And Did you ever see the male strike the female? I would say that I think I saw maybe a push or a shove, but not like a full-on punch to the face or anything. Was the shove or push an aggression towards her, or was it a defensive maneuver away from her or to get her away from him? It was unclear what was going on. It seemed like he was trying to close off the passenger side of the vehicle and close things up. It almost seemed like he put that backpack or something on the back of the vehicle, I'm not sure. And then he was stepping in and she was out trying to get in. So maybe, okay. Uh, I, I don't, it was, the whole thing was off. And, and so, no, I didn't see anything that was like him taking after her or hitting her or, or vice versa. There was a very, there was, it, it was kind of light and, they were almost kind of laughing, and I wasn't sure if they were just joking around, to be honest, but then it got more strange as he was in the vehicle about to drive off. Officer Pratt then confirmed that the female was slapping the male, but based on this conversation, it was obvious this witness didn't think that Gabby was a quote-unquote aggressor. Officer Pratt then pulls Officer Robbins aside and told him a very different story than what the witness had just explained to him. Officer Pratt said that according to the witness, Gabby was clawing through the driver's side door and the witness never characterized her actions using this term. That is a straight up lie. I, I cannot even understand why that came out of his mouth. The officer then defended Brian saying he was trying to disengage from her. He also misquoted the witness as saying, I saw him shove her, but I couldn't tell if it was an aggression against her or defense against her as far as her being the aggressor. But the witness never said this and clearly didn't think that Gabby was the aggressor. Ultimately, Officer Pratt still concluded that Gabby was the primary aggressor. So, uh, he said that he never saw the male strike the female. He saw the male trying to lock her out of the vehicle. She even told us that he was trying to lock her out, told her to go take a walk. So that she was trying to get in. She eventually couldn't get in and actually clawed her way in through the driver's door. He says, I don't understand why she's doing that. Well, I think it's because it was the only door that wasn't locked that she could get through. She's trying to get in over him. He's trying to disengage from her. I guess he hung her backpack on the back probably so she could have her shit so that he didn't have to engage with her. Everything she's saying is the same thing. I haven't heard what he said, but if that's what he said, it's also what the witness is saying. The witness says, I never saw him hit her. I saw him shove her, but I couldn't tell if it was an aggression against her or a defense against her as far as her you know, being the aggressor. So at this point, from what, unless the guy's screaming that he needs to go to jail and did something to this girl, it sounds to me like she is the primary aggressor. Yeah. With so much focus on who the primary aggressor was or who struck first, the officers failed to consider who was the dominant aggressor or which partner posed a greater potential threat to the other. 
Officer Pratt then went to talk to Gabby and joked around with her a little before saying he was going to speak to her frankly because he has a daughter around her age. So now getting some dad advice. He said he was looking at her not as a suspect, but as kind of a victim, kind of a victim. Because she's struggling emotionally and mentally and with angst because of her age. That's that's so dismissive. Belittling her, just being like, oh, you're just, you know, young girl dealing with young girl issues. Like, what? Mm -hmm. He then kind of scolded her for not being able to control herself, which is what made her a victim in the first place. And not Brian hurting her emotionally or physically. He said he would have been able to handle things differently because he's older. He explained that while they, meaning the officer, sympathized with her, Brian had marks on him that witnesses say were caused by her slapping him, and he was apparently referring to the childlike fighting that the witness had described. He then defended Brian Moore, saying that he had shoved her to prevent her from getting into the van or to get space from her and not to basically assault her, which is just, it's just so hard to believe that that's really what they thought, that Brian was just trying to get away from her to prevent an incident from occurring. So... Look, I'm going to speak to you frankly. I have a daughter almost your age, and I'm looking at you not so much like a suspect, but also as kind of a victim in the sense that you're dealing with some struggles emotionally and mentally at your age. Probably they'll work themselves out as you get older. There's a lot of angst at your age, and I remember being your age too. And hopefully it works itself out. But... The stuff you did today that, that contributed to this, because you both contributed to this, uh, is as a result of your inability to cope with the anxiety and the stress that you're having. So in a way, you're kind of a victim of this. Um, I think you would have done better if you had the skills to do better. But you don't learn skills until you learn skills. And you're not, you don't have enough life experience yet to know how to navigate everything. Like, I don't either, but I can navigate what happened. If I was in your shoes, I could handle it different because I'm 39 years old. I've been through it. He also explained the domestic violence laws in Utah to Gabby, which he said were made because too many cops have made bad decisions in these situations, which he was currently doing. Yeah, that was a really shocking part. So all that long windedness I'm giving you right now is leading up to the fact that if I pull someone for speeding, I have the right to give them a warning. I have something called officer discretion. But in, in the legislature in Utah, they have made a law that if we have a domestic assault, they don't trust the police to make good decisions because too many cops have made bad decisions. So they say, we're not going to give you discretion. We're going to write a law that says if you have a domestic assault, whether it's male on female or female on male, whoever the primary aggressor is has to be charged. No choice. You don't get to give them a warning. It doesn't even matter if they barely hurt at all and the guy doesn't want to press charges or the girl doesn't want to press charges. We don't have a choice. He also explained that she is the primary aggressor in this situation. So Brian will get to go spend the night in a hotel room as a domestic violence victim and she will have a court date. At this point, Gabby started to cry and asked if this was happening because a witness said something. And Officer Pratt said they heard from two witnesses, which is a lie, as he hadn't talked to the other witness who had actually called 911. And this was the witness that actually reported that the male was slapping the female. So Brian was slapping Gabby and he never spoke to that witness or even tried to pursue that further. Officer Pratt continued to defend Brian as Gabby begged not to be separated from him because she can't handle being alone for the night, and she pleaded with him to give her a ticket instead. Earn something, please, because we're okay. Like we're just. I understand, but we don't have we don't have like. Listen, if I had any discretion of this, I would separate you guys for the day and just give you warnings to stop hitting each other. (laughs) But I lawfully don't have discretion here. I, I don't have any. Because somebody said something, like a witness said something. But there's two witnesses, and then there's what you said and what he said, and guess what? It all matches nicely that that you were the primary aggressor, and that the injuries he has were caused by your aggression towards him. Even if he doesn't feel hurt, even if he doesn't want to press charges, there's nothing any cop can do about it. It's written into the law. I know that. I don't. Normally, we take people to jail, but he's trying to work it so you can just have the van. Tomorrow, I don't, I don't want to be separated. <laughs> you gonna have anxiety? Yeah, yeah. No, we're a team, please. <laughs> There's not. What is it? No, like we're a team, please. I'm gonna, he's gonna give me so much anxiety. Can we just have like a, a driving ticket? Okay, the, the very best thing I can do is call my supervisor 
and see if I'm missing something here. <laughs> I'll pay you any driving ticket, a parking ticket, anything. Okay, Gabby, <laughs> Gabby, better, try to calm down and I'm going to go call a supervisor. He told her he would call his supervisor to see if he's missing anything. And on that call, Officer Pratt explained that a tiny little girl slapped her fiance several times and he had a tiny abrasion on his jaw. He said this version of the story was according to two witnesses as well as Brian and Gabby and that his version was that she's pissed off and just having a bad day. So he's just trying to separate from her, but she won't stay away from him and that Gabby's dealing with severe anxiety problems and Brian had locked her out of the van in order to tell her to cool off. Again, he said that Gabby clawed her way past him in order to get into the van and that Brian was shoving Gabby, but it was just to get her out of the van so that they could get some space from each other. He also mentioned that she was punching, slapping everything. And then he had the nerve to say she's only 105 pounds soaking wet and said that she's really struggling with the idea of being alone. He basically then asked his supervisor what can be done under the law in regards to the domestic assault charge. At the end of the call, Officer Pratt decided to reread the statute because the spirit of the law is being lost on this one. Hey, so a tiny little girl, 22 years old, slapped her boyfriend, her fiance, several times. He's got a little bit of a, a little tiny abrasion on his, on his jaw. They got into a van and drove off. He got called in by two different, well, there's one caller and then a witness. Got them stopped. The story from the witnesses matches the story from the female, matches the story to the male. She was pissed off. She's having a rough day. He tries to separate from her. She's not staying away from him. She has severe anxiety problems. He locks her out of the van, says you need to go for a walk and cool off. She's forcing her way into the van. She's clawing her way past him into the van to be with him. He's shoving her to get her out of the van, but he's not assaulting her or he's not assailing her. He's trying to keep her out. She's punching, slapping everything. She's got to be 105 pounds soaking wet, 22, full of anxiety, having a really tough time. Not making excuses, but I mean, it is written in the code. We do have a domestic assault here. He's not wanting to pursue it. He's very adamant. He does not want to pursue it. We're mm -hmm. explaining we don't have we don't have any discretion on these things. We're giving him a no contact. We're letting see Cave and see if they can get him a hotel so she can have the van so that we don't have to put her in jail. She's she's really struggling with the idea of being alone and not with him and not having the van. They want to be together. Officer Robbins then comes to the window and they went over the statute and discussed their options. Officer Pratt said that according to Utah Code for Assault, assault is an attempt with unlawful force or violence to do bodily injury to another. This was the definition that he used to decide if Gabby should be charged. All the officers ignored whether or not Brian could fit this definition as well and whether or not he had caused any type of bodily injury to her. Which he which, clearly did. Yeah, we know she had a cut on her cheek and bruises on her arms. So I'm looking at the Utah code on the Utah State Legislature website for what the definition of domestic violence is. Uh, it basically means any criminal offense involving violence or physical harm or threat of violence or physical harm or any attempt conspiracy or solicitation to commit a criminal offense involving violence or physical harm when committed by one cohabitant against another. So to me, I mean, this seems like this fits this definition. And then there's a laundry list of aggravated mm -hmm. assault, mm -hmm. aggravated cruelty to an animal, just assault in general. Harassment is yeah. under this as well. There are plenty of reasons. And when they were considering whether or not she intended to do bodily injury to him, Officer Robbins said she went to smack him. Officer Pratt said that the definition of bodily injury is physical pain, illness, or any impairment of physical condition. Officer Robbins then starts to describe Brian's injuries, saying he had a swollen right eye, which is the first mention of this injury. Then Officer Pratt interrupts him to focus on intent. What mattered was intent, not the result to him. Assault is an attempt with unlawful force or violence to do bodily injury to another. So did she, did she attempt to do bodily injury to him? She went to smack him. Did, was, her, was, it, was it her intention to do him bodily injury? Now, that's what we have to find out. Because it says bodily injury is, that by definition, physical pain, illness, or any impairment of physical condition. Well, he's got a swollen... Right we don't care what the result was. We care about the intent. 
So we gotta go find a ten. Intent. What was her intent? What was her intention? But through all of this, they never considered that Brian may have intended to cause Gabby pain. Even though they had reports of him slapping her earlier. Yep. yep. And she has injuries. Scratches. She has scratch mm -hmm. mark on her face. That they know is from him. Officer Pratt then said that the reason they don't have discretion in domestic violence cases is because, and this is one of the worst parts of this whole thing, but he said, too many times women who are at risk want to go back to their abuser and end up getting killed. God. That is the most eerie thing to hear. It is. When it's I heard chilling, that part, honestly. I just couldn't even believe it. The reason why they don't give us discretion on these things is because too many times women who are at risk want to go back to their abuser. They just wanted him to stop and they don't want to have to be separated. They don't want him charged. They don't want him to go to jail. And then they end up getting worse and worse uh, treatment and then they end up getting killed. Then he says that he can't imagine Brian will end up being a, quote, battered man but added that he doesn't have a crystal ball. There's no possibility that Gabby could end up no. as a battered female. And them acknowledging that they're aware that women will defend and go back to their abusers and end up getting killed. And then there's no mention throughout all of this of the possibility that Gabby could be the victim and yeah, could end up getting it. killed. No. They even like legitimately consider it. <sighs> so they decided that they had to find out if Gabby was trying to cause bodily injury when she hit Brian saying that her answer would seal her fate. During this conversation, Officer Pratt repeated the language he used to interrogate Gabby about her intent, which was seen in Officer Robin's body cam footage. Gabby, this is a very, very important question. How you answer this question is going to determine what happens next. But the only person who can answer this question is you. When you slapped him those times, were you attempting to cause him physical pain or physical impairment? Was that what you were attempting to do to him? No. What were, you, what were you attempting to do? I was trying to get him to stop telling me to come back. The officers then talked some more, and Officer Robbins said that Gabby openly admitted that she was striking Brian, and then they went back and forth on what to do. She openly, well, I, she openly admitted to me earlier that she was striking him in the arm. He said that she was striking him. She said she was, and that's what caused him to hit the curb. She said that she grabbed her. I might have to myself probably. No, she, she said that too, but she started just distracting him by yeah. hitting him, and then he probably looked at her, and that's why the mark is on the, the window side. And she said it's her fault that he swore because she was distracting him by hitting him. But she said she didn't try to hurt him, it wasn't malicious, she thought that he, he wasn't listening to her. Officer Pratt left the final decision up to Officer Robbins and then left the scene. Just None shows of, they're not yeah. taking this so serious. Like, mm -hmm. it's I crazy. Know. None of the officers questioned Brian about his behavior at all, which includes the following. Okay, let's go over it. Locking Gabby out of her van, which was her home, and the officers just seemed to assume that the van belonged to Brian and even asked if he trusted Gabby with his vehicle. Plus, he also was trying to make Gabby stand outside in the heat with no water when she said she wanted to get water because she was thirsty. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Isn't it standard to ask for registration when you get pulled over? Yeah. Yeah. So then they immediately they they botch this whole stop so bad that's like a good from point, a you know? police perspective that because they should have ID'd both people. They should have confirmed who is the who is the actual owner of the vehicle, especially when trying to figure out who's locking who out. If that's even part of the. Mm -hmm. the investigation they should figure out who actually owns the vehicle and who's in the right here and they both this is their residence as well so they both they're both living out of the van so they both have equal right to being in, in the van but ultimately the van is it belongs to gabby i mean it's gabby standard owns the to van. find that information yes. absolutely that's that's great that's extremely frustrating they clearly judge both of them very mm -hmm. they saw two young young people and they're just like oh okay just some like teenage drama that we got to deal with young and, angst whatever yeah, he said exactly yeah didn't take it serious at all plus we also know that brian took her phone away from her which was her only way to contact her family and friends he also prevented gabby from working on her blog which she did speak in the body cam footage as well in the first release about how brian wasn't supporting her in it and how frustrating it was for her he didn't believe in her um also he put her backpack outside of the van to get her to take a walk, which she did not want to do. Then, of course, we know he grabbed her face hard enough to cut her skin. He grabbed her arms hard enough to leave bruises. And they never even questioned him at all about 
grabbing her face. I don't know how you can defend that. Plus, he lied about not having his own phone. We saw that at one point in the footage. He is telling them he doesn't have a phone. And then a couple minutes later, he's whipping it out. And you can see it right on screen. So he's just a liar. None of that was considered or even noticed, it seems like. Plus, he also claimed that Gabby grabbed the wheel while he was driving, while she firmly denied it, while admitting to much worse. The officers ignored common knowledge about domestic assault victims when considering Gabby in the situation. Some of the common knowledge they ignored was the fact that oftentimes victims defend and protect their abuser. If they don't, they'll pay for it later once they're alone with the abuser again. They blame themselves for the abuser's actions. Abusers gaslight victims into believing that it's their fault, that the abuser hurt them, and the victim believes their behavior drove the abuser to violence. So these things were clearly missed. Officer Pratt explained that the domestic violence law exists because women often go back to their abusers so they can't claim ignorance. He had excuses for all of Brian's behaviors and twisted everything about Gabby in order to make her the aggressor. Because ultimately, it just seemed like they were trying to wrap this up. Like, mm-hmm. we, let's wrap this thing up. Who's the aggressor here? Yeah. You know, is, is she going to admit that she was, you know, a physically assaulting him with intent to harm him? And, you know, we'll either make a rest there or just go on our way, not even taking into consideration the, the circumstances at all. The officers confirmed that Brian had pushed Gabby, grabbed her face, cut her cheek, grabbed her arms, left bruises on her arms, took her phone, locked her out of the van. But since Gabby wouldn't say he slapped or punched her, he was the victim. So it's pretty clear why this second round of body footage was held back. You know, luckily they did release it and it's made everything a lot more clear Um, But days before this footage even came out, the Moab police chief, Brett Edge, requested a leave of absence, which started on Monday, September 27th. And the Moab Police Department is being investigated. The city of Moab actually made a statement as well. The statement reads, the Moab City Police Department has clear standards for officer conduct during a possible domestic dispute. And our officers are trained to follow those standards and protocol. At this time, the city of Moab is unaware of any breach of police department policy during this incident. However, the city will conduct a formal investigation and based on the results, will take any next steps that may be appropriate. So, well, I mean, who knows what will come out of that. And there has been another missing piece of this. The media has been trying to get the footage from the female officer's body cam, but their requests have been denied. So we can only wonder what Gabby said to her and what's being held and why. So at this point, no one is charged and the police tell Brian to spend the night in the hotel. Gabby is going to stay in the van and police help get Brian the hotel room. He stayed at the Bowen Motel in Moab, Utah, and staff there said that he had stayed at the accommodation after police officers drove him there on August 12th. So, yeah, we know for sure that he stayed the Uh night there. Yep. Gabby posts photos from Arches National Park in Moab, Utah. Brian flies home to Florida from Salt Lake City to obtain some Some, uh, items and empty and close a storage unit to save money, which is according to the attorney. We don't know why he actually emptied this storage unit. That's so weird. The attorney is saying he did it so that they could extend their trip longer and have more, more cash to do so. Then August 19th, Gabby and Brian post a video to their YouTube channel, Nomadic Static. It's kind of like their first vlog. It's a compilation of things that Their they have done. Far, yeah, yeah, yeah. On August 21st, Gabby's father, Joseph Petito, last speaks with his daughter via FaceTime call, and he helped them order a pizza in Salt Lake City because of a powder power outage. And he talks to her about the trip so far. He later said that he noticed no rad, red flags during this conversation. Then August 23rd, Brian flies back to Salt Lake City to rejoin Gabby. And this is according to their attorney, Stephen Bertolino. Then August 24th, Gabby is spotted leaving the Fairfield Inn and Suites in Salt Lake City, Utah, which is located 700 feet away from the Salt Lake City FBI office. It was just kind of weird and eerie yeah, when looking back. It is. Then August 25th, we know that Gabby FaceTimed with her mom, Nicole Schmidt, for the final time. And Gabby was at this point near Grand Teton National Park in Wyoming. And in a later police report, her mom said that her conversations with her daughter revealed more and more tension between her and Brian. Then a final post is made to Gabby's Instagram. It's a photo of her taken at the Monarch in Ogden, Utah. And it's a happy Halloween post. 
August 25th or 26th, the couple chats with the owner of this shop called Rustic Row in Victor, Utah for about 20 minutes. We found out about this later, obviously, and Mm -hmm. they couldn't remember whether it was the 25th or the 26th, but they just recall that Brian and Gabby had come in and spent about 15 to 20 minutes in the store and they had seen them and spoken to them. So August 27th, Gabby's mother receives an odd text from Gabby that said, can you help Stan? I just keep getting his voicemails and missed calls. So Stan is her grandfather and her mom thought this was extremely strange that Gabby was referring to him as Stan because she always called him grandpa and never referred to him as his first name. So she immediately thought this was odd and was concerned that something was wrong with her daughter after getting that message. Gabby and Brian then visit a Tex-Mex restaurant in Jackson, Wyoming called Mary Piglet's. And staff members and other people at the restaurant recall a unspecified event with the couple. A woman named Nina Angelo, who's from New Orleans, said that she saw, her and her boyfriend both saw this actually, they witnessed a commotion between Gabby and Brian as they left the restaurant. She told Fox News that they were in town for a wedding and they watched this full-blown incident between the couple. She also said that Brian's body language seemed aggressive and that she thought he was arguing with the Mary Piglet's employees, which she noted were all female. And it seemed to be about a bill or money or something like that. And they left abruptly from the restaurant, Gabby too. And she ended up just standing outside the restaurant crying as Brian walked back in and was like, according to her, screaming at the hostess and then walked back out. And then he walks back in again, according to her, like four more times to talk to the manager and to quote like tell the hostess off so brian just exploded yeah over what Mm -hmm. the bill yeah i don't know i don't know conversation that they had she added that gabby seemed kind of embarrassed during all this and appeared to walk back into mary piglets at one point to try to find brian and get him to leave and she said quote i think she was being apologetic towards the restaurant staff for his behavior so this he's like completely Mm -hmm sent off a cliff he's out of control causing a public Mm -hmm. disturbance why did anybody call the police during this incident i don't know because he's he's this is like disorderly maybe they threatened to if he doesn't leave and he eventually left i'm not sure or gabby saved him yet again yeah from getting in trouble yep because she went back and got him out so then that same day four hours later on august 27th 6 to 6 30 p.m these travel bloggers the bethune families as well Uh, who it is yes they have kind of the same van life channel going on and they drove through the spread creek dispersed campground that same day and they happened to catch footage of gabby's van seemingly abandoned on the side of a dirt road and at the time obviously they didn't think anything of it and they went back and saw it later on and which this this ends up being like a huge tip probably the only reason we end Mm -hmm. up finding gabby in the first place it's possible Because when they did find Gabby, she ended up being very close to where that van was parked. And that tip was absolutely crucial. So August 29th, there were missed phone calls with a woman named Rose Davis. Rose is 21. She lives in Sarasota, about a half an hour from Gabby and Brian's home in Northport. And she last spoke to Gabby in early August and was planning to meet her in Wyoming's Yellowstone National Park in September. Rose had even asked her boss for a few days off for the trip. And they were planning to lock any specific date on August 29th, Rose's birthday. But Gabby never called that day. Also, Rose did an interview to kind of clarify some questions because there was a lot of rumors going around about her online. And she talked about some of the red flags that she had seen from Brian. Specifically, one evening, her and Gabby were supposed to be going out to a bar and Brian took her ID so that she couldn't get drinks. And when they got there, she realized he had taken it. I mean, he was just so controlling like that. And she said there's even more, you know, that at this point they're just not revealing. Well, we were supposed to go line dancing. It was ladies night. And her drive is about 30 minutes to me. And halfway there, she realized her uh, ID was missing. And so it caused a really big argument because Brian just didn't want her to go out. And it was a jealousy issue. And, um... It caused a huge argument between them and she came over and cried and just talked to me about what happened and told me all that she was comfortable telling me. 
I do believe that their relationship, as they kept going on, was getting a little, yeah, problematic. I mean, just seemed like there was more and more arguments and everything she did, I feel like, you know, he thought was wrong. And even as she said in the body cam, he didn't even support her with her blog, which that's not what a fiance or boyfriend does. They support you with anything you want to do. And that in itself made me feel like it just continued to get worse. Then August 29th, a Wisconsin TikToker named Miranda Baker claimed that she and her boyfriend were approached by Brian Laundrie at the Grand Teton National Park and that he asked them for a ride at 5.30 p.m. But he only briefly rode with them because he found out that they were going to Jackson Hole instead of Jackson, which he, I guess, was very confused. And then he freaked out and exited the car near Jackson Lake Dam and started looking for another ride. And that footage, if you want to see it, is in the last episode that we did. So after Brian exits the vehicle, he's basically going into hitchhiker mode. He's got his thumb up. And a woman named Norma Jean Halavec, who's a seasonal Wyoming resident from Florida, actually realized that she had picked up Brian on the 29th after she had seen Miranda Baker's TikTok video, which how crazy is that? And she realized that at 6.20 p.m., she had actually picked Brian up because she'd actually randomly visited a church for a 5 p.m. service at night that happened to be right where Brian was looking for a ride. And so she offers Brian a ride. He gets into the passenger seat of her forerunner and asked if she was going to Jackson. And when she told him no, because she lives in the opposite direction, Brian then asked her to drop him off at the gate of the remote campground which has a single dirt road that extends miles to various camping sites in the area. When Brian tells Norma this, she's like, okay, but I can literally, I don't mind driving you to your campsite. So you don't have to walk all that way. Like, why would you want to be dropped off at the entrance of this giant campground and then walk on foot to your campsite, which we obviously know why he didn't, he was starting to freak out because he didn't want her to drive back to where Gabby was. Uh, But basically She took him to the entrance of the gate, let him out, and it was only about a 20-minute drive from the dam where she picked him up and to where she dropped him off at the entrance of the dispersed campground. But at this point, it seems pretty clear that this is when Brian, most likely on the 29th, maybe maybe the following day, Brian then gets into the van and starts the 36-hour drive back to Florida. Because again, Brian arrives back in Florida on September 1st, and we're talking about 36 hours of driving. So, I mean, you're talking over a full day if you were to drive all day, all night. So it was clear that he probably hopped in. As soon as he got back to the van, he did whatever he did with Gabby, or maybe Gabby was already there, and then just jumped into the van and left uh, the campground. On August 30th, Gabby's mom received the last text from her phone saying no service in Yosemite. Obviously, she's not believing that this is Gabby at this point, and they were clearly nowhere near Yosemite Park, which is 14 hours away from Grand Teton National Park. We're talking about California versus Wyoming. Big, big distance between those two. So very, very odd text. And then at some point between August 30th and September 1st, Brian uses a Capital One bank debit card and a personal ID number for two bank accounts to spend $1,000 in Wyoming and elsewhere, according to court documents. And Brian's attorney has said that this was Gabby's card that was used. So that's why the FBI issued that warrant for his arrest is because he used this card without being authorized to do so. so at least as far as we know. That's the only thing he's a suspect That's crazy. as of now. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. Because- There's not enough evidence technically to say that he was the one who murdered Gabby. On September 1st, this is when Brian returns to his parents' home in Northport, Florida, in the van without Gabby, and Bryant visits his sister Cassie at her home as well, which we find out later on that that was what had happened. Mm -hmm. That wasn't the original report that we got. On September 4th, according to his attorney, Brian purchases a new cell phone from a Northport AT&T store with an older woman, likely his mom, which he leaves at his home before he goes hiking into the Carlton Reserve. And there was a lot of talk about that woman being Rose Davis for some reason that has been cleared up. Yeah, that's wild. I don't know why. And this phone that he purchased from AT&T was left behind when he allegedly went into the Carlton Reserve and that phone was seized by the FBI later on on September 14th. 
So going back to those tips that we discussed in the beginning that Dog the Bounty Hunter got, which for him, taking tips is very different than what the police can take because he can take anonymous tips. And that is what led him to Fort DeSoto Park. And he was able to confirm that they had reserved spaces from September 1st through 3rd in spot number one. And then they went back to the park with Brian and stayed in spot 15 from September 6th through 8th. And he said that when Chris and Roberta left on September 8th, Brian did not come out of the park with them. Later on, it was clarified, according to park records, that they did have reservations to stay both of those times. But the camping trip from the first to the third, Roberta had canceled and they did not go. Brian's attorney also confirmed that Roberta, Chris and Brian did stay overnight at the campground from September 6th to 7th. And we later found out that it wasn't just them who was out there. It was also Cassie and her family, which we'll get into here in a sec. But records show that Roberta checked into the Fort DeSoto Park campground on September 6th. That definitely happened. The park has turned over all security footage to investigators. And obviously now with the FBI involved, they have been very tight-lipped about anything that has come out from that. September 6th through 7th, we found out Brian's sister, Cassie, joined them and reportedly just spent the day camping with them on September 6th. Several witnesses also reported seeing members of the Laundry family in the park on 6th and 7th. Marcy and Kenny Newsom were actually visiting from Fort Myers, and they camped right next to Brian's parents. And they said they didn't see Brian or notice him while they were there, but then they looked back at their pictures, and he appears in the background of one of their selfies. Which is very weird yeah. that he wasn't seen, you know, everybody else is seen but Brian. So it makes mm -hmm. me wonder if while they were there, Brian was in essence hiding or just trying to just stay out kind of, of sight, low. kind of trying to lay low. Yeah, that's possible. Or not, they just didn't notice him. Yeah. Or they just, yeah, that's true. They may not have mm -hmm. seen him at all just because they weren't, I mean, they're there camping and trying to enjoy their time, not there investigating the laundry family. Mm hmm. Plus, there were photos from their trip that include a red truck and a camper that looks kind of similar to the one seen in the laundry's driveway. However, there's been a lot of debate over whether these trailers match up or even look anything alike. Mm, so, yeah. yeah, I don't know if I that's quite know. the same, same one. Know. So it's hard to say. I mean, people, it's hard to remember what you see in retrospect when you yeah. don't know what you're looking for. Right. Okay, before we go any further with the timeline, we're going to take another quick break and we will be right back. If you're out there and you take birth control, you probably know that remembering to take your pill is already enough work. So forget going to the doctor for in-person visits to get your prescription renewed and picking it up from the pharmacy. The Pill Club wants to help take the work out of taking care of yourself. The Pill Club is a birth control subscription prescribed by a medical professional and delivered straight to your door for free. The Pill Club carries over 120 FDA-approved brands, and most brands of birth control are free with insurance or Medicaid. Otherwise, prices start as low as $9 per month without insurance. Healthcare for women is just unnecessarily complicated, and the Pill Club makes it so much easier. They deliver your birth control to your door for free in discreet packaging, which is awesome. And what's really cool about the Pill Club is they have a licensed medical team. That's just a text away if you have any questions. So skip the office visit and waiting in line at the pharmacy and join the club today. Right now, you can go to thepillclub.com slash mile higher. And the Pill Club is offering a $10 donation to bedsider.org for every mile higher podcast listener who becomes a patient. Your donation will help low income individuals get access to birth control through bedsider.org. Again, that's thepillclub.com slash mile higher to get your first birth control care package and donate to help more women in need of affordable birth control. Remember, thepillclub.com slash mile higher, and you must use that link to make your donation to bedsider.org. Over here at Mile Higher Media and Higher Love Wellness, we absolutely love stamps.com. They've been a longtime sponsor of the show, and now they really, really save us tons of money with our shipping costs through Higher Love Wellness for all those packages we send out. All over the country, they have come in clutch every single day to provide us with the most efficient and affordable postage for whatever we need. Since 1998, Stamps.com has been an indispensable tool for nearly 1 million businesses, and Stamps.com brings the services of the U.S. Postal Service and UPS shipping right to your computer. Whether you're in office sending invoices, a side hustle Etsy shop, or your full-blown warehouse shipping out orders, Stamps.com will make your life easier. And what I love about it is it was super easy to set up 
I just had to have a computer and a regular printer in order to print the postage. There's no special supplies or equipment. And within minutes, I had everything up and running. I'm printing all of the postage I need for any of the letters packages, as well as anywhere I want to send it. And you get discounts on postage from not only USPS, but UPS, which is absolutely huge. And instead of having to go into the post office, wait in line, get your postage, and then drop off your package, I can literally have it all scheduled. I have a daily pickup scheduled for higher level wellness. USPS just comes to the warehouse, picks up all of our packages, and there's no fuss and no mess with that. So save time and money with stamps.com today. There's no risk. And with our promo code mile higher, you get a special offer that includes a four week trial plus free postage and a digital scale. There's no long term commitments or contracts. Just go to stamps.com and click on the microphone at the top of the homepage and type in mile higher. Again, that's all one word. That's stamps.com promo code mile higher. With stamps.com, you'll never have to go to the post office again. Then September 10th, the laundry's neighbor, Karen Roberts, said that she saw Brian at their house. Also September 10th, the day before Gabby was reported missing, the police were called to the laundry home twice. Apparently, these were not 911 calls, not emergencies, I guess is what they mean by that. And it was marked as problem settled for both calls. Then after this, Gabby's mom calls the Northport Police Department in hopes of filing a missing persons report. And police tell her that the report needs to be filed in Gabby's last known location. Gabby's mother reaches out to Brian and his family via text message at this point, trying to get in touch with Gabby, trying to get any answers from them, and receives absolutely nothing. Then September 11th, Gabby's family reported her missing to the Suffolk County Police Department in New York at approximately 6.55 p.m. Then that night, the police in Florida went to the laundry's front door And when they answered, his parents just handed them their lawyer, Stephen Bertolino's phone number. Because I think I think basically what happened was they were able to figure out that Gabby's Mm -hmm. man is sitting out in their driveway. I mean, come on. Pretty quickly. And so that's why the Northport police are there is because like, Mm -hmm. okay, Gabby's been reported missing in New York. And they were already her vans right here. It's so obvious. And they're like, we're not going to say shit. Here's my lawyer's number. Mm -hmm. And the Northport police at that point impounded the van. Mm -hmm. Um, that same day. But again, they were denied entry into their home in order to speak with Brian at this point. But they're aware. They're aware that Brian may have something to do with the fact that Gabby's now missing and he has her van. Right. And despite this, Brian disappears. September 12th, Grand Teton National Park Rangers began their search for Gabby Petito. September 13th, the Laundry family reported last seeing Brian leave his home wearing hiking gear and the parents initially told the police that they saw him leaving on September 14th, which is what we reported in the last episode because we were just going off of what the attorney was saying. But apparently they had some confusion about what day he actually left. Very convenient to to really Mm -hmm. mess that important detail up of your son be going missing. Yeah. Okay. So there's also been a lot of confusion around the abandoned vehicle. Brian's Mustang parked outside of the Carlton reserve. That's what we were under the impression was the case. That's what the media had been reporting. But th- it was because they were actually redacting that it had been at the, I don't know how to pronounce this. Can you say it? Mayaka Hatchie. Mayaka Hatchie Creek Environmental Park, which is 16 miles away from the Carlton Reserve. So why would he park his Mustang over there mm-hmm. and then hike 16 miles to the reserve to go hiking? And why is there so much confidence that he's at the reserve? Yeah. I mean, they must, I hope they have good reason to believe that with the amount of time and resources that have been spent there. Then Stephen Bertolino released a statement saying that the laundries hope the search for Miss Petito is successful and that Brian's family will be remaining in the background. Okay. Then Gabby's family responds to this statement asking for Brian to cooperate and provide answers to quit- critical questions. So just one thing I wanted to mention about Brian's car being found at the Maya Mayaka Hatchie Creek Environmental Park versus the Carlton Reserve. And I just made a note, like, why would he park 60 miles away? Mm -hmm. Well, apparently there's a 12 mile trail from this park Mm -hmm. that goes into the uh, the Carl, uh, the Carlton Carlton Reserve. Reserve. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where his family believed he was. So I guess it makes sense why they are searching there. But yeah, that bit has been really confusing because from the beginning, we're like, why? Well, first of all, why when they ticketed the car, did they not realize it was Brian's when it was, I mean, they didn't run the plates or anything. That makes no sense. Um, But also to think that he had parked it right outside the reserve was like, 
what? Why would he do that? It's just stupid. Um, so then September 17th, Cassie Laundrie is interviewed again. In her interview, she says that she has spoken to police, but not with her brother since he returned to Northport, Florida. I haven't been able to talk to him. I've cooperated every way that I can. I wish I had information or I would give more. I, I, this is all I have. Me and my family want Gabby to be found safe. She's like a sister and my children love her. And all I want is for her to come home safe and sound and this to be just a big misunderstanding. And that same day that she did the interview and it aired on ABC, police in Florida were spotted at the laundry home again. And they said they were not speaking with Brian himself, but with the laundry family at their request, but that they knew where he was. The circumstances surrounding this discussion are not clear yet, but police were seen searching a Mustang in the driveway and entering the home with a brown bag, presumably to collect evidence. September 17th, the Laundry family reports that Brian was missing to police. September 18th, police announced that they were searching the Carlton Reserve in Florida for Brian. However, they have announced that they have not found anything. Meanwhile, the FBI in Denver said that agents were conducting ground surveys at Grand Teton National Park in Wyoming with help from the National Park Service and law enforcement agencies. Then September 19th, FBI officials in Wyoming announced that they did find a body in Grand Teton National Park. They announced that the body was believed to be Gabby's, but they would obviously be doing a full forensic identification to confirm this. September 20th, police executed a search warrant on the laundry home. They seized Brian's silver Mustang and a hard drive that may contain evidence relevant to proving that a felony has been committed. September 21st, the FBI announced that the body in Wyoming was identified as Gabby's and that the cause of death was not yet revealed, but they did say that the manner of death is a homicide. September 22nd, police continued to scour the Carlton Reserve for any trace of Brian, but had no leads. They even brought in a specialized dive team to assist in the hunt. And they brought in a ton more resources. I mean, they brought mm -hmm. every possible search and rescue mm -hmm. resource known to man into the Carlton Reserve to look yeah. for Brian. Investigators say that Brian Laundrie's parents told them that he had gone there after returning home without Petito on September 1st. And neighbors of the Laundrie family have come forward to say that approximately a week after Brian returned from Wyoming, they saw him and his parents packing up their camper. And they were gone for what the neighbors described to Fox as a weekend trip. So this is this is like obviously really interesting because there are they really just going on an innocent family camping trip? to i mean i don't know of anyone who really believes that that seems so incredibly odd come on gabby was living with you guys she was part of your family cassie said that she was incredibly close with her children and none of them are concerned that she's gone or asking brian anything and they're just hanging out camping yeah why would you leave the house come on, that's no one believes that i mean i think it's pretty clear they were going there because they needed they now know the fbi is involved in this in the search mm -hmm. for gabby and they could be potentially surveilling them, mm -hmm. monitoring their phones. And I think they were like, we need to go talk about what happened in a place, hopefully where nobody mm -hmm. can listen in on us, kind of more remote. Yeah. And we can have that discussion of what to do about yeah. the situation. Yeah, it definitely could have been something like that, or it was all part of the escape plan. And Fort right. DeSoto was part of that plan. Right. Who which, really knows at this point? That's all speculative, of course. Which Cassie didn't say anything like that. She just said that they were they mm -hmm. went camping and they're just, you know, it was just a normal family camping trip. Actually, I think this is a good time for us to play this clip from an interview Brian Enton did with a former FBI agent named Jennifer Coffin Daffer Doffer. And she had some really interesting thoughts. So I wanted to go ahead and include that because it was pretty interesting and she's had a ton of experience. Almost 30 years in the FBI, right? Close to? 25, 28 in federal law. 28 years, okay. Do you feel Brian will be found alive soon? I believe Brian will be found alive. I don't believe it will be soon. I just believe he's going to be able to hide in his surroundings. I think he's a learned outdoorsman and survivalist. And I think because of that, he's going to be able to stay out of law enforcement's grasp for a while. Do you think Brian's parents are still in contact with him? Yes, although very loosely through the attorney. Because the, the attorney, I guess, can do that. 
Yeah, he has yeah. attorney-client privilege as long as he doesn't do anything in furtherance of any crime. Could the laundries potentially face charges? Absolutely. They could potentially face charges. Aiding and abetting, possibly harboring, depending on exactly how this plays out, what did they know, when, and so forth. Um, but the other thing is, were they involved in any way with any destruction of property, any cleaning, anything like that, that could speak to accessory after the crime and they could be charged with that. Someone's asking, what kind of personality do you think Brian has to be, he was acting so normal after Gabby went missing, if, if Cassie's telling the truth, that he was just acting normal at the camp, the camp out, like nothing was wrong? Well, I have to say, I don't believe Cassie. I don't think they were just sitting around roasting some Mars and having a little lemonade and hot dogs for dinner. I think that at that campsite, they discussed what happened. I think they discussed what they were going to do moving forward. And they discussed the exact details of how they would deal with the situation. And I believe that because why did they need to leave this house? I think they were concerned about FBI surveillance, about FBI overhears, about their calls being monitored, and they wanted to go someplace secluded so they could truly talk this out. On September 23rd, this is when the FBI officially announced the federal arrest warrant for Brian Laundrie for the fraudulent use or unauthorized use of uh, the debit card. And then on the 25th, this is when Dog the Bounty Hunter joins the search. And this is kind of where our episode, our previous one, left off. And at the time, Dog the Bounty Hunter received those Fort DeSoto tips. And basically, nobody else was searching over at this park. Mm -mm. And Dog was like, I'm going to go over there and start searching it. So that's exactly what he did. He was pretty confident when he spoke to the media that he believes that Brian's probably out here hiding mm -hmm. on one of these islands that are out here. So yeah, he did seem very confident initially. Yeah, he did. I was like, eh, I don't know. Yeah. So the reason I went to Mr. Landry is because I carry a reputation with me. The reputation is he gives you a second chance. He gonna get you, but he gives you a second chance. I thought the dad would answer and talk, but I was very persistent without disturbing the peace and knocked a few times so they saw it was me. Well, yeah, they've got so much infrared. I mean, they're gonna catch him. You know, I, the only reason I, I would doubt if he's in the swamp is they've been hunting it really good, okay? You know, I don't think he went to New York or uh, there's been a couple of rumors he might have went to Mexico. I've been to Mexico. If he's down there wanted, a white boy that doesn't know Spanish, the cartel's going to grab him for the reward. Well, now we work off leads. Somebody knows something. But Dog brought in, I guess we call him Dwayne, Dwayne Chapman. That's his real name. But Well, he goes by Dog. dog. I think he prefers Dog. <laughs> okay. Well, Dog goes out there. He's got a hand-picked team of individuals, former law enforcement, former Navy SEALs, basically ex-military, to go out there and search and this Fort DeSoto Park is about a 75 mile drive northwest from the Laundry's home in Northport. It's just southwest of St. Petersburg. And it's a very popular tourist attraction because it's this large park. It's on the ocean. There's a bunch of different islands that are all sort of interconnected that you can go uh, across to different ones to camp. But there's also little, little, little tiny islands kind of out off of the coast of these uh, keys basically so dogs like well that'd be a great spot for somebody mm -hmm. to go and hide out and potentially just try to camp out and um, tons of people visit every year it attracts more than 2.7 million visitors annually so it's you know a place where you could blend in right so dog went out there and did a pretty extensive search over the next couple of days um, really trying to figure out if brian was was ever there which obviously he knew brian was there based on the records that the, the mm -hmm. campground kept that, of them going there. But he also I, said he had found some personal items. He hasn't clarified what that is, but he also said he, he found a monster can. Yeah, and which she, I was kind of like, mm -hmm. what does that have to do with him, though? You don't know that that belongs to him. Yeah, unless, I, I mean, they're not using something. DNA. Right, exactly. So, he yeah. also said he found poop. Oh, he did? At this makeshift camp. Ew. And that he was, he asked about having the poop DNA tested, but apparently he can't. DNS DNA test feces in Why that way it? from well apparently 
I, I don't know exactly the science behind it, but apparently you have to use um, some other type of item. I don't know. I could be completely wrong on that, but that was what I had read in regards to the poop is that he, he was going to bring them the poop and they're like, we can't do anything with this poop <laughs> to confirm. Sorry. Cause I mean, he's trying to confirm if it's Brian's That's so gross, but that I guess he found some toilet paper or something that had some poop on it. So maybe they're going to try to DNA. Well, it's test also that. a campground and people poop outside. Yeah, exactly. It could be anybody's poop. These <laughs> items are very <laughs> insignificant for this, yeah, yeah. for this campground. I mean, there's going to be trash. There's going to be mm -hmm. probably feces mm -hmm. that you run across if you're just roaming through the woods of a campground. Yeah. So it's hard to be like, oh, this is a sign Brian was camping here. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, it is pretty, you know, we all were pretty hopeful that dog was on the right track and that this mm -hmm. was, in fact, where Brian might be hiding out. And he might still be. I think he's been asked to scale back what they're releasing, um, Yeah, you know kind of keep we don't know exactly what's going on mm -hmm. and and we don't know how this is going to turn out in the end mm -hmm. you know that's Who, true who's going to find him first dog and his team or the fbi i mean no one really knows at this point things have been extremely unpredictable throughout all of this right right while dogs out there at fort DeSoto park going taking boats to these little islands looking for brian the northport police fbi are still at the carlton reserve but after 10 days of extensive searching and, I mean, million, two million dollars put into locating Brian there. At that point. At that point, which on. it's, yeah, it's racked up far higher than that it's now. Still going on today. Yeah. Uh, they have start scaling it back a bit because, mm -hmm. I mean, they they search this uh, as much of this 25,000 acre reserve. It seems as like they're honing really in can. more on specific areas now yeah, versus kind of trying to search the whole thing. Exactly. Also, Brian's parents say that they do not know where their son is and that they just hope that the FBI can locate him, which mm, okay. who knows if that's so, true. September 28th, Brian's mom is accused of using a burner phone to contact her son. On September 29th, dog's search efforts really ramped up. And in addition to his boat and ground crews, they contracted a private canine unit, the Peace River Canine Search and Rescue Team, to aid in the search. Here's some clips of dog talking about his confidence in the canine units. These dogs are trained to track scent, the adrenaline of a human, not like a sock and find the guy. So these dogs are incredible. Got a bunch of volunteers out here, most of them former law enforcement or former Navy SEALs and Marines. So for the most part, Dog had been focusing on Egmont Key, which is a small island that he believes Bryant went by kayak at some point and spent the night. Lisa, his daughter, who has been kind of a voice for him on social media, told the media that during the search, they located personal items that they believe belonged to Brian Laundrie, and they theorized that he had hid on the islands during the day and that he was only active at night after people went home and was kind of making his moves at that point. And then it was the following day that dog confirmed on social media that they had found that, that monster fresh monster can which, out in the woods. Yeah, very hard to say. And there's we got a picture of that. I yeah. think that's kind of interesting. So I know because he's such a nature natural eats melons right. out of the run. Why would he be like, using hates, a monster can? Hates single use bottles. Yeah, exactly. You know, obviously, I don't see. I don't see. I don't. I feel like it's not. That's his. what I'm saying. It's a little mm -hmm. bizarre to me. That doesn't just like, my really match thoughts, up. Though. It's not like. Exactly. I mean, as far as we know, right. unless this guy's got a serious monster addiction yeah. and, and who knows don't know his whole it. like nature, I'm super ego could friendly, be yeah. could total, be a total act. Who totally. fucking knows? Yeah. But I it just could thought that be. was weird. It could be. Maybe you become desperate for energy at that point. True. You're willing to drink out of a single bottle. Use bottle. Yeah. yeah. And just leave it out there. But I don't know. It doesn't really match up with how he seemed to be portraying himself. Mm -hmm. I agree. So September 30th, FBI agents returned to the laundry home. This was on a Thursday, and they are seen looking at the camper, going into the home. And this was all caught on film by several media that were outside at the time. And the attorney for the laundry family said that the FBI was collecting some personal items belonging to Brian that will assist the canines in their search for Brian. October 1st, it also came out that Brian's sister had contact with him after she said she did. Hmm, interesting. The Laundry family said that they believe that he is alive somewhere in Florida as well at this point. So then October 5th, Cassie ended up doing an exclusive ABC interview in the wake of her brother's disappearance and following the death of Gabby being announced. And Cassie said that she last saw her brother at the Florida campsite with her family days before he was reported missing. She said she had no idea 
about anything being amiss and didn't realize at the time that he had returned home from his road trip without Gabby. I'm just like, how? How? Yeah, it's hard to believe that. I know. It is hard. And of course, we don't we don't fully know at this point, but it's just, it's very, very peculiar. We just went for a couple of hours and we ate dinner and had s'mores around the campfire and left. And there was nothing peculiar about it. There was no feeling of grand goodbye. There was no nothing. I'm frustrated that in hindsight, I didn't pick up on anything. It was just a regular visit. I've been cooperating with the police since day one. I have been in touch with law enforcement. I don't know if my parents are involved. I think if they are, then they should come glean. So Cassie's parents have been allegedly keeping her in the dark about what they knew. She says that they've kind of just cut her off after speaking out. And Brian's attorney released a statement saying that Cassie saw Brian twice in September, which definitely put a lot of heat on her. And there were protesters outside of their house who interviewed her as well. It turns out that Brian did stop by her home with his parents on September 1st, and they drove the Mustang over there. And it turns out Cassie and her whole family visited Fort DeSoto Park on September 6th and spent a few hours with Roberta, Chris, and Brian. During the visit, Cassie apparently never asked Brian anything about Gabby. What? There's no Come way. Come on. There, that's just like, like how, what happened to your road trip? Weren't you guys yeah, supposed to be there yeah. till Halloween? Yeah. Come on. There's a million questions that would Where's come to my Gabby? mind. Where's Gabby? I Doesn't just she can't live with you? understand that. Cassie did another interview on October 5th and revealed even more information. She said that Brian had flown back to Florida without Gabby on August 17th. And Cassie saw Brian during the visit. And she and her kids also FaceTimed with Gabby. Brian's attorney has confirmed this trip saying that Brian flew home from Salt Lake City on August 17th and then flew back to meet with Gabby on August 23rd. Apparently, the purpose of this visit was for Brian to get some personal items, close that storage unit, like we said, to help save money, which would allow them to ex extend the road trip. And then Cassie said that on September 6th, that was the last time she saw Brian, and that her and her family were at the park from 2 to 8 p.m. and didn't notice anything unusual about Brian no or her parents. No You're, way. Didn't overhear anything. Didn't come on. Mm -mm. And here's that interview I mentioned earlier of Cassie and her husband who were filmed outside of their home, just taking questions from protesters on October 4th. And they said that their main decision to come out and talk against the advice of the investigators and attorneys is because the protesters were upsetting their children. Was Brian with you on September 1st? Did he come to this yes, house? Yes, he came to this house with my parents in their Mustang, not the van. I did not know that he took that van back. I found out the next day with everybody else. We are just as upset, frustrated, and heartbroken as everybody else. And I am losing my parents and my brother and my ch children's aunt and my future sister-in-law on top of this. And you're not helping. Why your parents? Why, why your parents? You're talking about Christmas. They're not talking to us either. Why aren't they talking to you guys? If I knew, <laughs> I would say. I don't know. Do you think they're involved, your parents? I don't know. You don't know? We know. You're not involved? We have literally <laughs> been finding everything out with the news with like everybody else. What did you guys do on the 6th through the 8th at Fort DeSoto? We were at Fort DeSoto on the 6th. We got there at around 2 o'clock and we left around 8 because the kids had school the next day. On the 6th? On the 6th. We only stayed for about 6 hours. We. Who was there? My mom, my dad, my brother. Where else have you seen Brian since That's since September it. 1st? I have not September seen 6th. anybody after 8 o'clock on September 6th. Is there anything the FBI can do to put more pressure on the parents to talk? Well, I think one thing that needs to be done is we need to put pressure on Cassie to talk. I think Cassie wants to talk. I think Cassie would talk in the right environment. And I think once she talks, I think the pressure and the heat heats up on the laundries. Do you think Cassie is telling the truth? There are so many things she's not telling the truth about. Uh, the thing I think she's telling the truth about is she's angry that people are out front and they're upsetting her children. And I think she's very angry that the laundry attorney dropped her in the grease and exposed that she was on that trip. I think that's what she's telling the truth about. Other than that, I give her an F for telling the truth. You give her an F. Wow. Pretty much. I think she might know about the troubled relationship that they had, even though she said she doesn't know anything about it. Uh, it just seems to me that she's going to have that information because they lived with Petito 
and laundry. Also during this period of time, Gabby's parents and step-parents spoke out publicly in an exclusive interview with Dr. Phil, which aired in two parts on October 5th and 6th. And during this interview, they revealed more information about the area where Gabby's body was found. Her stepfather, Jim Schmidt, actually traveled to Wyoming while Gabby was missing because her family believed this is where she'd be found and wanted to have someone there. Apparently, the area where they had been camping had remnants of a campfire next to a small clearing where a tent had likely been pitched. Gabby's remains were located just in front of this clearing, about a five minute walk from where the van would have been parked on that road. Jim actually saw the area for himself and he left a stone cross as a memorial to Gabby there. The family also said they believe Chris and Roberta Laundry know more than they're saying and confirmed that they never responded to any of the frantic calls or texts from Gabby's family while she was missing. And initially, the Gabby's family thought that both Brian and Gabby were missing and were worried about both of them. But after reporting Gabby missing, they're informed by the police that Gabby's van had been found in Florida without Gabby. Also on October 6th, the abandoned vehicle incident report for Brian's Mustang was released. And according to the report, the vehicle is ticketed at 2.42 p.m. on September 14th. But the narrative portion of the incident report has been redacted. Meanwhile, during this time, the Carlton Reserve is still closed to the public because the searching is still going on. Uh, It was scaling back quite a bit at the start of October, but then on Wednesday, October 6th, it really ramped up after there was a reported discovery of a campsite. That day, there was significantly more activity in the reserve than in previous days, including the use of a large drone, ground searches, helicopters, and at least 15 law enforcement vehicles. The Laundry family's attorney confirmed late on October 6th that law enforcement asked Chris Laundry to assist in the search efforts at the Carlton Reserve. So the following day, October 7th, Daddy Laundry got out there and started searching the area for his son in connection with Gabby's case. Law enforcement said they wanted Chris Laundry to direct them within the Carlton Reserve to a spot that he claims Brian might be hiding. He was then picked up in an all-terrain vehicle by a member of law enforcement and was driven into the woods. On October 8th, an officer from Northport Police told the media that so far, nothing has been found in the reserve to indicate that Brian has ever been there other than his Mustang being ticketed on September 4th, which we found out wasn't even right at the the entrance to the Carlton Reserve. It was a totally different park. (laughs) Yeah. The officer did acknowledge that authorities are keeping some of the details of the investigation from the public, which I'm sure we all assume that. And when questioned about whether or not Brian had been under surveillance when he first disappeared, the officer responded saying that they were doing all they could under the law with the facts that they had at the time. The police will continue their search for however long it takes, they say, to find out what happened to Brian or where he is, and this could take a very long time. The officer also indicated that there's about a 50-50 chance that they're searching for a dead body, which I know so many people are just really worried that that's going to be the outcome here. And I'm trying not to even let myself go to that. And some, I don't know, something that's just total personal opinion and speculation, but I just don't think, I don't know. I think he's out there. I have a feeling he is out there and that if he had committed suicide, why would he try so hard to hide his body? That's my only thing, you know? Well, the other thing that's interesting about that is there's uh, ranchers or people very familiar with the Carlton Mm -hmm. Reserve noted that if there was something dead in the reserve, there would be Mm -hmm. birds overhead. Like there would be wildlife reacting to a dead body Mm -hmm. for sure because they've seen it before with dead wildlife, things like that. So the fact that none of that has been spotted Mm -hmm. may confirm that he's not dead in the Carlton Reserve. Yeah, at this point, I guess no one knows. So the search in the Carlton Reserve has continued. It's still continuing today. However, Chris Laundrie has not been back to the reserve, and he and Roberto Laundrie appear to be cooperating with investigators, as far as we know, at this point. They're still not talking with media, putting out any statements, And they seem to be very annoyed with the amount of people and media outside of their house. Um, There's been a lot of questions about how are they living here with, you know, how are they even functioning? It's been so long with this going on, but they're getting a lot of groceries delivered. They used to leave the house and go get groceries, but then they were like being harassed and yelled at outside of the house. So they've stopped that. Now they're doing DoorDash, which can you imagine being a DoorDasher walking up to that house? Oh my God. Yeah. Then on October 12th, the Teton County coroner, Dr. Brent Blue, announced the autopsy results at a press conference. This was done over Zoom, and he said that Gabby died 
by manual strangulation done by human hands. The estimated time of death is believed to be three to four weeks from the time that they found their her body. Yeah, which is, oh my which because at first, you know, we were kind of speculating why they say human remains versus mm-hmm. like a body. But now that we know this piece that the body had been outside three to four weeks. In the elements, possibly yeah. decomposing. And he didn't No, clarify. for sure decomposing. Well, yes, no, I, that's what I meant. I meant possibly was just out in the open they because they did not yeah. clarify whether or not she was buried or right. if there was any wrapped up in con- something attempt or- to conceal her or anything like that but they did say that she was not pregnant which has been a rumor that's kind of been circulating since the beginning and he said something kind of interesting that seemed to really shock most reporters um, when he was taking questions he said something about domestic violence which wasn't expected because he's not supposed to be confirming anything about the actual crime. He's only supposed to be talking about the state of her body. So there's been a lot of questions about that, but now that really has confirmed that this was domestic violence. So in the last couple of days, there's been a few developments with the the manhunt for Brian Laundrie. Uh, According to a spokesperson, apparently the FBI and the Northport Police Department requested for a cadaver dog to be brought in to, to help in the search, I guess. And as of yesterday, Friday, October 15th, uh, there was yellow tape around the entrance to the Carlton Reserve, but it it turns out that apparently law enforcement was doing a training exercise out there and everybody was freaking out because they're like all these people with guns and they thought maybe they're closing in on Brian. Twitter and the media went nuts because they, yeah, they did have all these different guns and people thought, oh, they've, they've got him. Right. They're arresting him or today's the day. And no, they're doing a training exercise, which seems so what? odd in a place. You're actively looking for a murder. Yeah. And murder? I, I mean, obviously <laughs> like, we don't, ha- we're not in law enforcement. We don't yeah. know, but Could I've have been heard a many thing. experts talk about how that is like unheard of and extremely unusual. And that especially a case like this, that has so much media coverage and tons of eyes on it. People, tracking helicopters and watching every yeah. move on TikTok, you'd think you'd release some type of statement saying, just so you know, there's going to be a training exercise going on here today because it just caused complete chaos yesterday. Yeah. Just odd. The whole thing was weird. So that kind of leads us to, you know, what's next and where is Brian? I mean, it mm-hmm. seems pretty obvious to most of us. I mean, we only know so much. Maybe there's more information around the Carlton Reserve that, you know, is being kept from the public, which is very possible because I mean, they are spending tons of money and resources in there still. But otherwise, if he's not in the Carlton Reserve, where is Brian? And that kind of leads us to where we were at the end of last episode, where we were talking about the Appalachian Trail and dog's theory around that kind of discussed whether that could have been a possibility. And it's kind of seeming more likely now. We talked about in our last episode that dog had received a tip from a friend of Brian or an acquaintance of Brian that he had spent a long period of time, at least a month out in the Appalachian trail, possibly alone. And so it could be somewhere he's very familiar with and could survive for a while in those elements. Dog, the bounty hunter has also been working to confirm a tip about a recent sighting of Brian laundry near the Appalachian trail. This came out last week. Lisa Chapman, his daughter, told the Post that she has been in contact with Dennis Davis, who claims he spoke with Laundrie on a deserted road near the border of Tennessee and North Carolina on Saturday morning. That's crazy. Yeah. And obviously unconfirmed. We don't know if it was actually him. But this is interesting. Pretty certain it was because he called 911. Yeah. Yeah. Let's listen to the call. Hey, we're County 911. What's the location of your emergency? Well, I'm I'm on the highway right now, but um, I, I ran into... Brian Lauer, just a little while ago. I was at the parking lot for the Appalachian Trail, the north side of on Waterville Road. He was he was driving a truck, and I stopped and spoke, talked to him. It was a white truck. I think it was a Ford F-150. I'm not a hundred percent sure of that. And it was kind of a, a newer model. It wasn't like an old beater. It was a, a newer truck. And he came up behind me and he slowed down and kind of flashed his lights, like telling me, oh, go ahead and go and I'm going to wait for you. And as I turned around and I'm coming back by him, he's waving his arm out of out of his truck, like for me to slow down. And I pull up next to him. He was, he was talking wild. 
he t- he said that his girlfriend loved him and he had to go out to California to see her. And he was asking me how to get to California. And I said, well, you can get on I-40 right there and drive west and you'll get there. And he said, no, I think I can go this way and kind of left. But he was acting funny. And I wasn't sure about what he looked like. And then I got, I went and parked and pull, pulled up the photographs of him. And I'm 99.99% sure that was him. Dog's daughter ended up sending Dennis an audio file of Brian's voice. And after he heard that, he said he is certain that that's who he talked to. And I started talking with the gentleman. Um, I could tell right away there that um, he wasn't, something wasn't right with him. I'm absolutely 100% sure that was the guy. My heart was thumping. I'm telling you, this was the guy. Two deputies were immediately sent to the area to search for Brian. And Dennis told the media that he had a 45 minute in-person interview with the FBI. And the same day that the 911 call was released, the FBI confirmed that they were looking into multiple sightings along the Appalachian Trail. The Hayward County Sheriff's Office has also reported that they received at least 10 recent calls related to the Brian Laundry search. Then at some point, Dog ended up going back home to Colorado. I guess he has a produc- production company based in Castle Rock, Colorado, which I did not know that. Um, his daughter put out a statement saying dad is headed back to Colorado temporarily to handle some business. Remember, he was in Florida on his honeymoon. We are still actively searching for Brian Laundry, leaving a team in place in Florida. As always, whatever I can share with you, I will. Um, there was also reports that dog had injured his ankle during the search, and that's why he went back to Colorado. Not completely sure on that. But I guess he plans to meet with his doctor in Colorado to assess the injury. I mean, dog the bounty hunter is 68 years old. Yeah, he is. He's definitely. And he's out there searching. I mean, yeah, it's like it's bound to happen. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So let's talk about another person who's been very vocal in this case. And that is John Walsh, who is very well known in true crime. I'm sure most of you know who he is. And he's been very outspoken about this case for Mm -hmm. sure. He recently was in a new special on ID discovery called Gabby Petito ID special report. And in that, John speculates that Brian is currently being aided and abetted by his parents. Mm -hmm. He's quoted as saying, I absolutely believe that his family is helping him stay on the run. Which is also what FBI agent Jennifer Coppendoffer said as well. Yep. His show has also gotten a ton of tips uh, regarding Brian Laundry. He said, we've got people from all over the world calling, saying that Martians got him and took him to another planet. And he's inside hiding in an alligator in a Louisiana swamp. Hiding in an alligator? (laughs) Yeah. Oh, my God. What the hell? Um, But John has also said that he's gotten solid tips of sightings in the Bahamas, Mm. which Brian may have accessed from Florida via ferry. Mm. But John's main belief is that he is actually in Mexico. He has said that we've had over a thousand solid tips to the In Pursuit hotline, and most of them are about my theory of his father driving him to the Mexican border and letting him go through Mexico. He said it's a great time to be heading south because there are thousands of refugees. I mean, he could literally walk across the border naked with his hair on fire and nobody would notice him. And that's the quote. This is what John said. Yeah. I think that maybe that's where he's hiding and somebody might be helping him. Which is interesting because dog was all yeah. confident. He's like, he didn't mm-hmm. go to Mexico because the cartel would get him for the right, reward money. Right. Blah, so blah, the blah. opposite. Yeah, yeah. Very contradicting opinions here from John and dog. Right. So John also got a tip from an unnamed former friend of Gabby and Brian's who said Brian actually bragged about living on the Appalachian Trail for three months out of a backpack. Yeah. Which is even longer than we what heard from the, the other first tip. Yeah. I don't um, know. It seems to me that that's most like i mean it would make sense he's familiar with the appalachian trail he's already lived out there for multiple months at a time potentially yeah. so and even though john walsh personally believes that he's in mexico he does he did say we've gotten plenty of tips about the appalachian trail as well so right so that kind of leads us to where i mean i know there's really not much else to to really cover with this other than Hopefully we we find Brian Laundry. And of course, by the time that we do upload this episode, it will be a couple days after we've recorded. We're trying to get it up as quickly as we can, but it does take time to edit a full episode this long. Um, so we will include any of any new information, any m- major breaking news in the case in a pinned comment or in our description box. But yeah, the FBI is still looking for information. So if you have any, you can call 1-800-CALL-FBI. You can also upload photos to fbi.gov slash petito. 
Uh, but Lisa Chapman also tweeted out a series of pictures showing unique features of Brian's in order to, you know, give that information to the public in hopes that they'll be able to identify him. He has some interesting tattoos, uh, di just different things that, mm -hmm. you know, if you saw this, then maybe you might be able to point that out. Because obviously he's trying to hide his identity as right. much as possible, but how much can you hide your tattoos and, um, you know, specific markings or... right. And then also if he's grown his hair out, his beard, things mm -hmm. like that, people Photoshop pictures to try to help and, and create, you know, what he might look like as well as a forensic artist creating sketches of what Brian could look like if he changes his, his appearance, shaved his face, or maybe he loses weight if he's indeed living off of the land. She also said that she thinks it's likely he's using a baseball cap to hide his appearance. This is super common and that most right. likely if he's smart, he's going to shave his facial hair. Right. And she thinks he'd be about 10 pounds lighter by now. So he could look completely different. But yeah, so if Brian Laundry is seen by, by anyone, obviously don't approach mm -hmm. him, call 911. And please don't take a video of it and then post it to TikTok yeah. because yeah, that's doing literally fucking nothing. So get that information to FBI or police as soon as you see any anything that you really right. genuinely think could be Brian Laundry. I mean, don't yeah. fuck around with it at all. Call immediately. Which the standing reward for information leading to his capture is up to one hundred eighty thousand mm -hmm. uh, dollars. Dog has even thrown in some money into that reward as well. So yeah, it's only going to go up. Yeah, it's going to keep going up. I mean, I think he's going to be found eventually. It's just is he going to be found so. dead or alive? I, I mean, hope so unless he literally just disappears into the Appalachian mountains and never to be seen again i, mean, I just hope for this family's sake I that know. they can get justice and closure for this because that would be such a terrible ending after all of this yeah so let's just hope he's out there and and, and can find him i want to find out what his parents know yeah oh yeah and we'll, we're gonna know more and more about clearly that over time. there's more than they're telling us yeah i mean yeah. it's pretty obvious at this point it's gonna but. take years for all of this to come out yeah. and fully make sense yeah so and right I mean, now we're just trying to make sense of what we can and who knows, available. like this might really slow down to the point where, I mean, it already has in recent mm -hmm. days, like as far as updates and mm -hmm. some of the, the reporters who've been on it hour after hour, are like, yeah, not much. Yeah. Not much has really changed as far as other the than the update goes. in from the corner manner of death there. It's been pretty slow. Yeah. yeah. And we don't even know the full. I mean, it'll probably be a long time before we see the full extent of the autopsy report if we mm -hmm. ever see it. Mm hmm. Um, cause obviously, eventually, yeah, eventually and toxicology and all that. Yeah. yeah. And clearly the FBI knows a lot more and FBI keeps it very tight lipped. Like they're mm -hmm. not going to say anything, yeah, what they're working on. That's just how they work. They never do. So yeah, it's just kind of a waiting game at this point, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. And we can only hope that law enforcement is hot on his trail and they track him down and bring him in yeah. alive or someone. Yeah. Like, somebody. Yeah. So with that being said, we want to know what you guys think, of course, about everything. Where do you think Brian is? If he is out there hiding, do you think that he will be brought in dead or alive? I'm curious about what you guys think on the release of the newest body cam footage. And if that is at all, you know, changed your perspective of the situation or brought new things to light for you. At this point, I think it's just so important we discuss it and that there's as much conversation around it is possible and how things could be handled differently or better in the future to save other lives. And so I know there will be a lot of, you know, fighting in the, com in the comments, disagreements. And I, th I honestly think all that's healthy and good and important. And we need to be having these discussions as uncomfortable as they are. So feel free to tell us what you think in the comments below. We always like to hear you guys' feedback. That is all we know at this point. I'm not sure when we will make our next update on the case. We're just completely waiting to see what happens at this point. Yep. But that is going to be it for us this week. We will be back. You guys have been requesting a lot for Halloween content this month. There is one more week left of October. So we are going to come through with some spookier content next week for you guys. Um, because I know a lot of you have been wanting that. We've just been very yeah, focused. I'm very excited. On Maybe a little bit cases. paranormal paranormal uh, mm. activity to discuss. Mm, I'm scared. Okay. <laughs> well, anyway, that's going to be it for us this week, guys. We hope you found this episode interesting. But until next time, keep taking your mind a mile higher. Free and fire.